My name is David Zarrett. I serve Indiana University as its Vice President for International Affairs. And it is a pleasure to welcome everybody, and especially our out-of-town uh, visitors, to the Bloomington campus on this magnificent fall day. It is just great outside. Uh, if any of you raise your hands and want to know if we can hold class outside, uh, I think we'll be unable to accommodate you, but I certainly would understand the motivation. Uh, we're here to celebrate the 50th anniversary, anniversary of Indiana University's Inner Asia and Uralic National Resource Center, uh, which coincides with the 13th annual uh, symposium for the Central Eur uh, Eurasian Studies Conference. I think just about everyone at Indiana University takes a lot of pride in our internationally renowned programs that teach and study the languages, the history, the cultures of the Eurasian heartland. The roots of this activity at IU extend back to World War II, but the establishment of the Title VI Center in 1962 was a transformative milestone, as Dennis Siner himself observed a few years after the establishment of the center. Before the center, which initially was named the Uralic and Altaic Language and Area Title VI Center, before the center, teaching, and here I quote Dennis, teaching was confined to language courses, but after the establishment, the cultural and historical background of the peoples speaking these languages became a subject for research and teaching. Only a few years after establishment of the center, the existing program in Uralic and Altaic studies was reorganized and enhanced and transformed into a department with its own tenure-line faculty. So like many other Title VI centers, the IAUN at IU has had a transformative impact on the local institution as well as on teaching and research in the broader field. I began these remarks by saying how proud we all are that IU has long been the home for research and instruction in a very wide range of topics relating to Central Europe, uh, Central Eurasia. At IU, this activity occurs at the highest levels found anywhere in this country and with only a few exceptions anywhere in the world, perhaps uh, uh, Russia for obvious historical reasons. Now that remark <clears throat> that I made applies to me. One of the high points of my career of nearly a decade's long service, though not continuous service, in the Dean's Office of the College of Arts and Sciences was my opportunity to work with many directors and chairs, respectively, of the Title VI Center and of the department. This would include, in no particular order, Toivo Raun, Elliot Sperling, Bill Fearman, Chris Atwood, and Ed Lazzarini. And I think this is an appropriate moment for us to acknowledge the dedication and talent that they invested in maintaining and advancing our preeminence in this field. I also think that today's keynote spo sp uh, spokesperson is especially well suited to the task of helping us celebrate the NRC's 50th anniversary. Robert O. Blake is in his fourth year as Assistant Secretary for the State Department for South and Central Asian Affairs. Robert has been in the U.S. Foreign Service since 1985 with postings to U.S. embassies in Tunisia, Algeria, Nigeria, and Egypt, as well as at positions in the State Department in Washington. Uh, this latter would include his service as senior desk officer for Turkey. Prior to his current position, Robert's service abroad includes appointments as ambassador to Sri Lanka and, the, as they say in France, Maldives, and Deputy Chief of Mission in New Delhi. Robert earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard, and he holds a master's degree from the School of Advanced International Studies at Hopkins. You should also know that he comes from a diplomatic family. His father, also Robert, served 30 years in the U.S. Foreign Service, including a term as Ambassador to Mali. 
Robert Jr. is married with three daughters who probably do not get to see him very often considering your travel schedule. You spent part of the September in Kathmandu in Nepal, in the Maldives, and in Sri Lanka. Your August schedule included Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. On the agenda in these locations were the full range of very important bilateral and regional issues, regional stability and security, democracy and human rights, counter-narcotics, education and cultural exchanges, and economic development and trade. This work is demanding and not without its dangers, as we have recently been tragically reminded. Ambassador Blake and the Italian ambassador were injured in a mortar attack by Tamil Tigers on an airbase in Sri Lanka in February 2007. And just uh, before my remarks, Robert was telling me he has a piece of shrapnel extracted from him as a souvenir. <laughs> in view of Robert Blake's career of distinguished service as one of this nation's most senior foreign service officers for Central and South Asia, I cannot imagine a more appropriate keynote speaker for the events that mark the 50th anniversary of our Inter-Asian and Uralic NRC. The topic of his talk is Central Asia, great gain, not a great game. I thought perhaps you might work in a reference to Tournament of Shadows as, <laughs> as well in the title of that talk. So please join me in welcoming Robert Blake. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zarad. I appreciate that very kind introduction. And for all of you uh, students who may want to ask me later about getting pieces of shrapnel in me in life in the Foreign Service, I'll be, I'll be giving a talk later on, I think at uh, 6.15, about a career in the Foreign Service and uh, you know, what a great time I've had in the Foreign Service and I think would be hopefully uh, quite an interesting time to for many of you to, to serve and to, to live a life of consequence and to uh, make a difference. So if anybody are, are interested in hearing a little bit more about that afterwards, uh, please come join us. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Zarat and everybody for inviting me here today. Um, as, as he said, this is a very important and momentous anniversary, a 50th anniversary. But uh, this has always been known as one of the real premier centers of learning on Central Asia. So I, since I began this job in May of 2009, I've been looking for an opportunity to come here and to interact like this. So I'm really, really delighted to be here. And I'm, I'm particularly delighted to be here on such an important uh, anniversary for Indiana University. Um, I'll also say that uh, the United States government is proud to be supporting uh, two of your partnership programs that are now taking place between uh, Indiana University and Afghan universities. And we talked ab about some of the other things that we are all doing together in, in places like the American University of Central Asia. So there's already a lot going on. And uh, I'm glad to, again, talk about that later in, in the question and answer period. Um, this is a quite momentous time for the Central Asian region. And I'm really delighted to be here today to talk to you about America's foreign policy priorities in Central Asia and why we believe that our engagement there will not lead to another round of the great game, but rather will contribute to the achievement of a great gain for Central Asian countries and all of us who partner with them. So to that end, I'll discuss first our security engagement in Central Asia the United States' commitment to Afghanistan's security transition, the momentum that we see building around the new Silk Road regional integration vision, and the importance of supporting human rights, democratic reforms, and creating space, space for civil society. We think that by working together with our Central Asian partners, other important countries like China and Russia, and other international partners like the EU and many, many others, we can indeed create a prosperous and secure region that offers great gains for all. 
So let me start with security. Security in Central Asia is obviously a key strategic interest for the United States and, of course, for each of the Central Asian countries, particularly as they look ahead to the transition in Afghanistan after 2014. Our security cooperation with these nations in Central Asia focuses on, on enhancing border security, strengthening regional counter-narcotics efforts, countering violent extremism, and working towards a stable, secure Afghanistan. Expanding our cooperation in this area not only helps countries to deal with these security challenges, but it helps to solidify our diplomatic ties and deepen and broaden our partnerships. If a country is willing to cooperate in the area of national security, they also are more likely to cooperate with us in other areas as well. But security cooperation is not the end goal. Indeed, we've built on the momentum created in those security discussions to broaden and deepen our bilateral partnerships across the board. When I came into office in 2009, one of the first things we did was to try to establish um, a series of what we call annual bilateral consultations that are led typically by me with the foreign ministers of each of these countries. And through these ABCs, as we call them, we've established a mechanism by which we review in great detail, usually over two, two days, every aspect of our relations, not only what we're already doing, but more importantly, how we'd like to take the relationship to the next level and how we'd like to expand and broaden our cooperation. So we're looking at everything from security assistance to economic investment issues to educational and cultural exchanges and, of course, to human rights and democratic reforms. It's important to note, of course, that we always take into account the political, economic, military, and human rights situation in every country when deciding what kind of security cooperation to pursue. As an example, we only provide non-lethal assistance to Uzbekistan now because of concerns about human, its human rights record. But we continue to engage with that very, very important country, and we make clear that our relationship can only really reach its full potential when Uzbekistan meets its human rights obligations. So turning to some of the specific security things that we're working on, let me start with Kazakhstan, where we have really excellent cooperation, starting with nonproliferation issues, but also including everything from improving the regulatory framework for strategic trade controls and working, of course, on all of our mutual security concerns uh, stemming from Afghanistan and the broader region. In Kyrgyzstan, which also hosts the Manas Transit Center, through which every one of our troops that's going into Afghanistan transits. We're helping that new democratically elected government to reform its security sector and to address issues related to corruption and rule of law. We're also helping the government improve ser services for its citizens. The Northern Distribution Network that many of you have heard about is perhaps the clearest example of the benefits to the United States that our security engagement with the Central Asian countries has yielded. Over the past year, we have seen how the Northern Distribution Network has provided critically important alternate routes for the non-lethal cargo for our troops in Afghanistan transiting into Afghanistan. And this has been particularly important when we began to experience problems with Pakistan and they closed off these ground lines of communication. So when that happened, all of the cargo, the non-lethal cargo going into Afghanistan, came down through the Northern Distribution Network. And it was really our bureau that was in charge of negotiating all of those transit <coughs> agreements and laying the basis for that, which I think has been a quite an important gain for American security interests. Let me talk a little bit about the Afghan security transition, which is on everybody's minds in Central Asia. In addition to, of course, our important bilateral security relationships with the Central Asian countries, we're hoping to help facilitate regional coordination and support 
for Afghanistan. The Central Asian countries are vital partners in support of the International Security Assistance Forces efforts against the Taliban and Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, especially as Afghanistan increasingly takes the lead for its own security. As many of you know now, Afghan National Security Forces are responsible for control and security for roughly 75 percent of the country. None of us has an interest in seeing Afghanistan ever again become a platform from which Al Qaeda or other terrorist organizations could ever attack our <coughs> homeland. And likewise, the Central Asian countries share that interest and will remain very important partners as the NATO presence replaces the ISAF mission in 2014 and as Afghanistan embarks on what we call its transformation decade from 2015 to 2024. The United States is likely to maintain a presence in Afghanistan after 2014, but the particulars of that are still to be negotiated with Afghanistan. We are committed to the success of Afghanistan's security transition and a regional security and we, have, of course, have, co have communicated this to our Central Asian friends. As Secretary Clinton has pointed out many, many times, a secure, stable, and prosperous Afghanistan can only exist in a secure, stable, and prosperous region. And as the security, political, and economic transitions in Afghanistan proceed, we think that the neighbors in Central Asia will have an increasingly important role to play. And indeed, I think the leaders of these countries understand the increasingly intertwined nature of security and the need for regional cooperation and coordination. In working with the states that border Afghanistan or that are impacted by Afghanistan security issues, I personally know all the, 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 uh, that all of them recognize the depth and the complexity of the challenge of ensuring regional security in a very, very tough neighborhood. The resolve of the international community to deepen the roots of Afghanistan security is strong, as evidenced by the NATO summit last year in Chicago, not too far away from here. And together, the international community and the government of Afghanistan have agreed to fund the Afghan National Security Forces at a level of about $4 billion per year in the period after 2014. Just as importantly, in July in Tokyo, international leaders met and pledged over $16 billion in civilian assistance from more than 70 international donors. But we also made clear that Afghanistan itself has responsibilities as well. And that's why donors in Afghanistan agreed on what we call a mutual accountability framework in which Afghanistan has pledged to improve its governance, which is going to be a key part of uh, ensuring stability in Afghanistan after 2014. So all of these are significant contributions. But perhaps just as important is the way in which the international community has rallied to support Afghanistan and the region. And unlike past approaches in the mold of the so-called great game in which one or a few countries directed top-down change without regard to local input, today's integrated approach enjoys broad-based regional support. Security assistance and cooperation with our Central Asian partners are certainly important but they are not by itself, themselves enough to help ensure future prosperity. As Afghanistan increasingly assumes full responsibility for its own security, and most of the foreigners, foreign troops leave, Afghanistan will also need to transition economically from an aid-based economy to a trade-based economy. The best way to achieve that is to try to integrate Afghanistan into the larger region. 
The more Afghanistan is integrated economically into its regional neighborhood, the more it will be able to attract private investment, benefit from its vast mineral resources, and provide economic opportunity for its citizens. That is the essence of the new Silk Road vision outlined by Secretary Clinton last summer during her landmark speech in Chennai, India. That is to strengthen regional economic integration and promote economic opportunity between South and Central Asia with Afghanistan at its center. Regional governments can do this first through trade liberalization, which includes the reduction of non-tariff trade barriers, improved regulatory regimes, transparent border clearance procedures, and better coordination of policies. Secondly, they can help through infrastructure investment to connect goods, services, and people. Now, many of you have likely been hearing about the new Silk Road vision for some time and are familiar with how the conversation around this vision may have evolved over the last year. Whereas we used to hear a lot of skepticism and questions about how can this possibly ever happen? How can the Central Asians put aside their differences and begin to work together? We're now instead hearing from these government them themselves how can we support efforts that are already underway to do more? Because they agree on the importance of greater cooperation and integration. They are participating actively in regional mechanisms such as the Istanbul process, in which the countries of the region are strengthening cooperation through seven confidence building measures, including combating narcotics and terrorism, disaster management, and infrastructure development. They also embrace the goals of the Regional Economic Cooperation Conference on Afghanistan, or RECA, which is helping to facilitate greater economic integration. But most importantly, the countries of the regions themselves are providing assistance to Afghanistan to help ensure Afghanistan's future stability and their own. At the most recent RECA meeting in March, where I represented the United States government, the countries of the region agreed for the first time to advance a series of projects and reforms that can help unlock the region's potential for private investment, greater trade and transit, and increased economic growth. The Central Asian states are taking concrete steps and are committing their own funds to implement the action plan that was agreed in March. And let me just give you a few specific examples. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan are all providing electricity to Afghanistan to help meet rising energy demands there. And through projects such as the CASA 1000 project, which is a project to link uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan through electrical grids. Electrical lines running through Afghanistan could some days transfer surplus hydropower in the summer from Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uzbekistan has constructed a rail line to Mazari -e Sharif and is considering its extension to Herat. Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Afghanistan are together building a rail line that will provide a new trade route and outlet for Afghan goods to the Caspian. Kazakhstan also is providing assistance to educate young Afghan students and has expressed its intention to establish a Central Asia Disaster Management Agency. When we speak of rail lines, we should not overlook the economic potential of the Northern Distribution Network. The existing infrastructure and transit routes used to transport military cargo can and should be used by the private sector to increase trade across the region where there's ample opportunity for growth. The economic potential of a more open and integrated region is virtually unlimited. 
Another key piece of regional infrastructure will be pipelines. There has been very good progress on the most important of those, which is the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India gas pipeline, or TAPI. This would link the vast gas reserves of Turkmenistan to the very fast growing energy markets in India. We were very pleased that uh, recently Turkmenistan and Afghanistan cooperated on a roadshow for the first time uh, that began to market the idea of a consortium that can now help to build this pipeline. And I think as the countries of Central Asia pursue greater energy independence, the strong link between water and energy, something that the Soviets capitalized on in establishing a unified electrical grid at, at, at that time, will require much greater coordination to ensure growth and stability throughout the region. And this is something I can come back to, is this nexus between water and energy, which is very, very important, but also one of the most sensitive issues now in Central Asia. Another very strong priority for the United States in Central Asia on the economic front is to boost regional integration through open markets uh, using the World Trade Organization accession process. Over the past year, the United States has been working very closely with uh, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan uh, on their accession hopes. They both hope to exceed in 2013. We have signed our own bilateral agreements already, and again, we're very strongly supporting both of the, these countries' accession. Uh, they will join Kyrgyzstan which uh, joined quite a long time ago already. And we've been very pleased that Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan as well are uh, taking fresh steps to now reinvigorate their own WT WTO accession processes. And we think that these efforts are clear signals of a desire on the parts of these countries to increase trade both within the region but also beyond. Likewise, regional mechanisms will have a very important role to play. I mentioned earlier the, the RECA process. Another very important one is the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program, or CARIC, that is run and facilitated by the Asian Development Bank. CARIC includes Afghanistan and Pakistan and envisions a transformation of the region through transport corridors and energy infrastructure to help drive economic growth. By 2020, the CARIC program will have committed $20 billion to improve these six trade corridors that now traverse Central Asia. Three of the corridors link the economic hubs of Europe and the Russian Federation with East Asia, while the others link East Asia, Europe, and the Russian Federation with South, South Asia and the Middle East. Finally, engaging women in economic activity is another imperative for regional integration. Last year at the Women's Economic Symposium in Bishkek that we helped to organize, we hosted 200 dynamic women business leaders from across the region and Afghanistan. And we invested $1.7 million to provide training and promote women-run business networks and trade hubs. In de December, we plan to host a similar event in Dhaka in Bangladesh to do the same thing for South Asia, but also to try to link those hubs between South and Central Asia. The United States will continue to engage our Central Asian partners and support these initiatives, but we're also not alone. In contrast to the politics of the past, where a few great powers treated the region as a chessboard, today we see that deep international coordination is very, very important. Some might argue that even today it would be better if two or three important countries imposed a top-down recipe 
for economic transition and tried to force others to fall in line with this vision. We would argue just the opposite. Regional economic transition can succeed only when led by the region itself, alongside contributions from and deep buy-in by the international community. And I believe that the message is clear. The countries of Central Asia and their neighbors recognize the need for greater regional economic coordination, and they see concrete benefits. We support this approach as a mechanism to increase coordination among the Central Asian states, to grow Afghanistan's economy, and ultimately to, cre to create a network of economic activity that spans from Kazakhstan to Russia, China, Turkey, India, and beyond. Success will depend on the involvement of a wide range of non-governmental actors as well, including not just the Asia Development Bank, but the World Bank, the Aga Khan Development Network, the Islamic Development Bank, and many, many others. The amount of infrastructure development that is needed is considerable, and certainly more than any one country or institution can support on their own. So there is much to do. To seize the opportunities for increased integration and cooperation, the region's countries themselves also have to overcome obstacles. They have to ensure the rule of law, reduce corruption, reduce non-tariff barriers to trade. They have to lift impediments like long delays at border crossings, lack of protection for intellectual property and copyrights, and onerous and often contradictory foreign investment rules. And they need to address often opaque and unpredictable regulatory environments. Progress on removing these impediments would spur greater interest by U.S. companies in the region. And we've already seen quite considerable interest on the part of American companies. At our annual, business, at our annual consultation this year in Uzbekistan in, uh, in August, we were jo joined by delegations from 25 major American companies, including General Electric and Boeing, all looking to explore more activity, uh, um, opportunities in Central Asia. In Ashgabat, in Turkmenistan this May, more than 100 U.S. companies participated in a U.S. business ex exhibit there, organized by our embassy in Turkmenistan and held in tandem with a, a forum that was sponsored by the U.S. Turkmenistan Business Council. Let me now turn to uh, the future of democracy in Central Asia. U.S. engagement in Central Asia on regional economic ties and stability and security of Afghanistan has brought unprecedented opportunities for us to expand our dialogue on human rights and democracy. In the last year, we provided about $25 million in assistance to the countries of Central Asia to support democratic reforms, human rights, and the rule of law, access to information, and civil society. We have seen some progress, but much, much more needs to be done. Kyrgyzstan has seen the most progress, where we've seen peaceful transitions of power since 2010, testifying to the growing strength and resilience of Kyrgyzstan's democratic institutions, in particular its parliament. But there are still some very serious underlying challenges in Kyrgyzstan, such as the need for ethnic reconciliation between the Kyrgyz and the ethnic Uzbeks in southern Kyrgyzstan. All of the Central Asian states continue to struggle to put into practice the values enshrined in their OSCE commitments, in the UN Human Rights Treaties, to which they have all acceded, and in their own domestic laws. We continue to use every opportunity for engagement to urge the Central Asian states to address human rights and democracy concerns and to ensure space 
for peaceful exercise of fundamental rights, such as those of freedom of assembly, expression, association, religious belief, and respect for ethnic minorities. We also continue to emphasize that respect for the right to free speech, free media, and the right to peaceful worship reduce the appeal of violent extremism and contribute to sustainable and effective governance over the long term. Put very simply, institutions like a free press and an active civil society, far from being threats to these countries and to these rulers, are valuable feedback mechanisms that can help governments to be more responsive to the needs and wishes of their people, and frankly, to avoid the pitfalls of the Arab Spring. Likewise, strengthening the rule of law and democratic institutions will help build transparent and, and predictable political investment climates that can help promote economic growth, reduce youth unemployment, and benefit all the citizens of these countries, not just a small elite. <clears throat> the annual consultation mechanism that I talked about earlier has been a springboard for deepening our engagement with civil society in all of the countries of Central Asia. This August, I had the privilege of hosting with the Uzbeks our first ever civil society forum as part of our consultations with Uzbekistan. For the first time, we witnessed civil society representatives and members of the Uzbek parliament and government speaking frankly across the table to each other. And we hope this dialogue can now expand and move into areas where they can begin to cooperate with each other for the first time. We've had similarly productive conversations and interactions between civil society and the government of Kazakhstan. And we look to have those with all of the other governments as well. We're also exploring ways to expand our people-to-people -people ties with Central Asia, since that undergirds so much of what we try to do as diplomats. To take one example, over 40,000 Americans and Kazakhstanis have participated in State Department bilateral exchanges in the last 20 years. In 2011 alone, about 50 American colleges and universities hosted 3,200 students from throughout Central Asia, including almost 1,900 from Kazakhstan and 560 from Uzbekistan. But in many cases, the enthusiasm expressed by governments needs to be backed up with increased institutional support for initiatives like the Fulbright Program, the English Language Fellows Program, and higher education cooperation. So let me conclude by saying that as I look to the future now, I'm more optimistic about the future of the region and the United States' continued commitment to the stability and growth of Central Asia. Today, we enjoy regular, sustained contacts with all the Central Asian states on a broad and deep range of issues. The agenda and the candor of our dialogue increases every year. Our assistance to the region in the areas of economic development, health and education, border security, counter-narcotics, democratic reform, will continue to play an important part in advancing our overall objectives. In any diplomatic relationship, one must establish a common framework of trust, a mechanism for communication, and a vision for the future that benefits all people. We have come a long way in establishing these with our Central Asian partners. And today, we look forward to a future where the countries and the people of Central Asia can work together with each other and with the international community for peace, security, democracy, improved governance, 
in economic development and prosperity. The good news is that the United States is not alone in its desire to see a better and more prosperous future for Central Asia. We will continue to work with a wide range of actors, including particularly Russia and China and the EU, through mechanisms such as the Istanbul process to build an integrated region that offers great gains for all, not just economic prosperity, but increased stability and a greater voice for civil society. And although the pace of change can be slow and the challenge is substantial, I am more convinced than ever that principled persistence, consistent and constructive engagement with our partners will bring about the change that we seek. So again, I want to thank Indiana University for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. And I'd be glad to take questions on anything I've just talked about or anything else that's on your mind. So again, thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's great to be here at this great university. Yes, sir. Ambassador Blake, I'm working at Clear. I worked in the area for a long time, and I'd like to ask you uh, about uh, your vision for regional cooperation. Yeah. Uh, you are right to dismiss the old trope of uh, the Great Game. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, you should be aware, and I probably are aware, that some elements of the Great Game persist in Central Asia. Now let me point out one, uh, which you don't mention at all. On the one hand, you talk about TARF, for which I worked. Uh, Central Asian Regional Economic Cooperation. We don't mention that Xinjiang, uh, that is the People's Republic of China, is a member of that organization, as well as Afghanistan and Pakistan. I'm sure you knew, you knew that. Sure. Uh, and TARF uh, envisioned the idea of greater trade cooperation among the countries of Central Asia, including uh, the Sinchang Uyghur Autonomous Repu uh, uh, Region. Right. On the other hand, uh, very recently, in the last two or three years, uh, Russia and Kazakhstan have started, along with Belarus, a new regional cooperation organization called Eurosec, uh, which does not include China, does not include Uzbekistan, so far doesn't include Turkmenistan at all, and this includes high tariff barriers uh, between uh, China, Uzbekistan, and other members, uh, and Kazakhstan, creating considerable discomfort in Kazakhstan. So I'd like to ask you, I know that it's not the role of the ambassador to stir up trouble. <laughs> I always stir up and trouble. I think you're very good at not stirring up trouble uh, and being optimistic, as most of us have to be in the area. But what is the policy of the U.S. government with respect to these two apparently competing visions for regional cooperation, which have definite conflicting um, uh, instruments uh, in the area? Well, thank you. That, that's a great question. And, you know, l let me just say that um, the, the vision that I articulated is one of, of open markets and open trade routes. And I think that the vast majority of these countries want to see that. Um, let's just take Kazakhstan, because Kazakhstan is probably at the nub of this in the sense that they have indeed formed a customs union with both Russia and uh, Belarus. Kazakhstan did it for the very simple reason that they hoped that because of the difficulty of working in Russia, that they will be able to attract a lot of firms to, that will come invest in Russia and then be able to take advantage of the customs union to export back into to Russia. To a certain extent, that's worked, but I think it's, it's very much a work in progress. Um, at the same time, Kazakhstan is very eagerly moving ahead with uh, trying to accede to the WTO. And they are at pains to, to tell us that they, that they see their long-term future as uh, much more with the United States and, and Western Europe and, again, and indeed opening up to investment from around the world. 
And one of the most striking things about Kazakhstan over the last three years that I've been dealing with them has been that their whole framework of, of thinking has expanded. They see for themselves uh, a growing regional role. You saw that in their chairmanship of the OSCE. You saw that in the fact that they are now the, the head of the OIC, the Organization, organization for uh, Islamic uh, Cooperation. And you see it in a whole bunch of other areas where they increasingly want to begin to project their influence well beyond their own region. And that's something we very much welcome because they, we think they can be a very constructive force. And it's the same on the trade front. They are very actively seeking uh, greater trade investment from the United States. They, they want to have open markets with us and the, and the WTO process will help ensure that we will continue to have that. And um, that's why we are putting such an important emphasis on this. You mentioned, um, you know, Eurosec and, you know, there, there's been a, a lot of talk about now that President Putin has come to power of, of another uh, Eurasian um, region of some sort. And thus far, I think the countries of the region have not really embraced that vision, precisely because they want to see a much more integrated um, uh, region. And increasingly, they look uh, not north, but south. Uh, we, if you talk to many Uzbeks and you say, what is going to be the most important market for your goods in, in, in 30 years? It's very interesting that they will most likely, uh, I, you might think that they might say China. In fact, they say India. Uh, because India is going to be, in about 15 years, the third largest economy in the world. And if transit trade can be opened up between India and Pakistan in particular, that will open up huge opportunities for India to access the markets of Central Asia, but even more importantly for the Central Asians to begin to market their goods to the south. So they are very, very interested in this, and that's something obviously that we strongly support, and that's the heart of all of what we're trying to do. So that's just one example. The Chinese likewise. The Chinese are very interested in trying to move their trade with Europe ac across land. So. Um, they, one, of the, one of the very important CARA corridors is the one that goes across Kazakhstan. And it's been fascinating over the last several years for me to see countries like Latvia and Lithuania become much more engaged now in working with us to promote all of these difficult uh, trade initiatives that I've been talking about, to reduce the delays at borders, to reduce, to harmonize uh, you know, customs procedures. To, to do all the, the, the sort of software of trade development that is so, so important. So I think that, the, just to sum up, I, I do believe these countries are looking well beyond sort of these narrow uh, customs union, things like that, and do have a vision of a much broader uh, region that is integrated with the rest of the world. But, you know, this is very much a work in progress, as, as, you, as you yourself said. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ambassador, for a very interesting uh, talk. You, uh, I'm Um, you mentioned the Middle East one time, you mentioned the Arab Spring yes. one time, and you also mentioned, uh, fortunately, democratization and the rule of law. Yes. And I'd like to spring more off Please. Of those things. There are two countries, the United States, uh, invaded in rapid succession, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, in the case of Iraq um, uh, and Afghanistan, uh, well, the two countries uh, sort of compete with one another as to which is sort of more corrupt in any given year, uh, and which has established a better kleptocracy uh, by international standards, and also in terms of democratization, both countries are uh, extremely uh, difficult uh, in terms of transparency, uh, the rule of law, and so on. Now, in the case of Iraq, it seems to me that uh, both the Bush and, and the current administration uh, have embraced the new political elites in Iraq, notwithstanding the failure of democratization of the rule of law to take it hold. That's not my question, however. That's merely an observation along the way. Uh, in the case of Afghanistan, where I think a very similar uh, argument could be made that we have the same concerns, my question to you, sir, is what are specific United States policies in respect to engaging the political givings, not the sort of capacity building and engaging civil society that you talked about, but in terms of engaging the, the political powers that be in Afghanistan, what's the 
specific politics are in place to ensure that the political elites will engender uh, democratization and the rule of law after the United States withdraws. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, let me begin by saying I'm not directly responsible for Afghanistan and Pakistan, so I'm not the, the, the boss of that region. But I, of course, I do work on this a lot. Um, I, I would just answer your question on Afghanistan by saying that uh, the, President Obama has been focused like a laser on rule of law and corruption in Afghanistan. Not just because we want to be sure that our taxpayer dollars are being wisely spent, but because the absence of rule of law and the, and the corruption that does exist has been a, a very corrosive factor in Afghanistan. And so it's, it, it's extremely important for the future of this country for this to be job number one in terms of uh, you know, change in Afghanistan. And I think that's why you saw, I, I think in, in, in my speech I mentioned this mutual accountability framework that was developed uh, after the Tokyo conference. Uh, the donor said, we are prepared to help you in Afghanistan to fund this development decade, this transformation decade from 2015 to 2024. But we are only going to do so if you yourself take responsibility for addressing the very deep concerns that we still have about corruption and the rule of law. Because uh, not only is that going to help us in terms of uh, justifying our own assistance, but even more importantly, it's going to help you, Afghanistan, to win the trust and confidence of your own people. So there's a, there's a huge range of programs that are going on now at every level uh, to try to first root out corruption and to have um, you know, many of the institutions that we have in our own government, very special investigators and things like that who work on these things. But there's also an effort uh, through our assistance programs, for example, to work with the um, individual ministries to try to get to the point where we don't have to have American contractors on the ground administering money, that we can give money to a specific ministry like the Ministry of Health with the confidence that they will be able to have the accounting mechanisms and the mechanisms for ensuring uh, that money is wisely spent so that we can, we, we can transfer much more of that money directly to them. So there's a, there's a lot of those kind of things happening as well. So I'll just say that this is a, this is a very important priority that you correctly um, targeted and it's, some, and it's, I'd say, one of the most important things that we're working on now. Uh, but there's still much, much work to be done. Hello, my name is Laura Adams, and I'm director of the program on Central Asia and the Caucasus at Harvard University. Welcome. And I wanted to um, uh, point to something you said toward the end of your talk about institutionalization and cooperation. Yes. So I'm sure I, like many people in the room, are concerned about the cuts in the Title VI programming. And Um, the, for, for some programs, like my program, which is was, was very nominally funded by Harvard, <laughs> um, that the cuts were a huge blow. We went from having one course per semester on the region of Central Eurasia to one every two years, basically. Um, so I know other places like Indiana are fortunate to have a, a resource, a national resource center, and a great Department of Eurasian Studies, for example, which most universities. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice for us um, trying to build the institutionalization of Central Eurasian Studies in the U.S. and trying to create the next generation of young scholars that will help inform people such as yourself in doing your work. Um, what would you suggest for us to try to do in terms of working with the U.S. government or perhaps other entities in building the institutionalization? Uh, that's that's a, a great question and a you know an important one. I, I'm not, as you say, I'm not responsible for Title VI and Title VIII. Harvard needs help. But um, yeah, I never thought, as a graduate of Harvard, I thought I never thought I'd hear somebody say Harvard needs help. But uh, <laughs> no, I, even before I had graduated, I'd received my first request for money from Harvard while I was still paying off my bills. So uh, they're, uh, they have uh, an endowment larger than the GDP of many countries. So. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's going to require, you know, 
you, like us, have to be entrepreneurial about raising money. Um, even, even we, we face, as everybody knows, the, the famous fiscal cliff. And so uh, all of us have to, to justify on a very minute, down to the very small details, every single program that we have underway in places like Central Asia. And I'm happy to report, actually, that we have been able to defend our program and that our program is, is largely intact and has stayed um, at, at very good and high levels because of the importance that the President and others attach to what we're trying to do in Central Asia. But increasingly, we do more and more uh, public-private partnerships and things like that to leverage our foreign assistance and to work through other partners so that we can get a, basically a multiplier effect uh, of what we're trying to do. And we find that the private sector is willing and, and able and, and interested in doing this. Um, so I, my, my, I guess my, my main suggestion would be what you're, I'm sure, already doing, which is that you need to work and identify the companies that are already interested and already doing good work in the region. They certainly have a strong interest in supporting these kinds of programs. Um, we'll be glad to you know, work with you and talk to you about that. Uh, and we, you know, we, as, I, as I say, we've been very active in organizing trade and investment missions to the region over the last three or four years. Um, but beyond that, you know, we have, we have an entire bureau in, in the State Department called the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. And uh, they also are very, very focused on this important issue of how do we try to build up some of these programs in Central Asia and in other parts of the world. Um, we have a, we, we've been very focused on India because um, we have 100,000 Indian students here in the United States and many now, Amer uh, many uh, American universities want to do more in India, but it's still a very uncertain regulatory environment. So we're trying to sort of help to, to catalyze a way forward on that. Uh, so we've organized a lot of very, very important con conferences. But I think in Central Asia, um, w of course, we're already working through institutions like the uh, American University of Central Asia, Nazarbayev University. And those universities have been very successful in establishing partnerships with American universities here. Um, so uh, maybe you could leverage those kinds of partnerships as well. So those are kind of three ideas uh, about ways. But to be honest, I, I, wouldn't, I can't sit here and promise that there's going to be a lot of American government money for these kinds of things because it's just it's a very, very tight uh, budget situation right now. And um, again, we're, we ourselves are under great pressure to do as much as we can either to, to do these public-private partnerships of one sort or another or just to cut the programs altogether. And we fought vigorously to, to prevent those, from those cuts because it's just you know, it would be very destabilizing, we think, and we've, we've successfully made that argument so far. Yes, sir? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I, I've already talked a little bit about the corruption in the Afghan context, so let me talk about it in the Central Asian context a little bit. Um, you, you may be surprised to hear that, that I think the Arab Spring has actually had a salutary effect on Central Asia because uh, the leaders of Central Asia have been following with uh, interest, dare I say, alarm 
the, the situation in, in the Arab Spring. And I think they've taken away some quite important lessons that we've been trying to reinforce with them. And I think um, one of the most important lessons of the Arab Spring is that um, countries like, Central, like uh, Tunisia and Egypt had kind of this toxic combination of very high levels of, of youth unemployment, but also um, very high levels of corruption and, and a, a very large disparity between the way the elite were living and the rest and, and the, the vast majority of the rest of the population. Having lived in both of those countries, I can per, per, personally attest to that. Uh, and the, the, the countries of Central Asia also have seen um, that this can happen in their own neighborhood. And it happened in Kyrgyzstan, where um, a demonstration that began about electricity prices outside of Bishkek suddenly morphed into a demonstration against the government in Bishkek. And several days later, the president of the country was sent packing. He, he left because he was worried about his own security. And with our help and many others, um, a, a, a democracy was born after, after quite a lot of uh, difficult times. But I think, again, I think that was a quite instructive um, lesson to many of these countries. Uh, so they, I think, have, have understand particularly well the, the crucial importance of corruption. And it's something that we try to reinforce. If you go back and look at public statements that I make in the region, uh, I talk about corruption all the time because I think it's such an important part of, of governance and it's such an important thing for them to deal with. Um, I've been very interested that in Kazakhstan, uh, as you know, they've had um, quite a number of challenges over the last year. They've had the, the riots in Zhanozhen. Uh, they've had a series of, of terrorist incidents over the last year. And um, uncharacteristically, perhaps, for the region, the Kazakhs have been willing to look inward and to acknowledge that these, and not try to blame outside agitators, which is the normal course of business in Central Asia, but to actually look inward and, and understand that, in fact, these are, these are local indigenous problems that they have to deal with. And in fact, they've begun to sack um, regional government leaders who were notoriously corrupt. And I think that President Nazarbayev has been very focused on this. So there has been some progress, and I'm glad to see that this, do, that this is resonating a bit. But it's still an enormous problem, and I can't, I can't under, understate what a, what a huge problem this is. And it, it's particularly bad in places like Tajikistan, which are very, very poor to begin with. And so the temptation for uh, a, a government bureaucrat or somebody who's serving on, at, at, at a border customs crossing point, who's getting paid a very, very tiny amount of money and being offered huge amounts of bribes to allow you know, opium or other kinds of things to cross over, you know, it's, it's immense. And it's all very well for me to sit here in the comfort of Washington, D.C. or Indiana and sort of wag my finger at them, but they also have to, you know, make their, uh, help their family and feed their family. And it's a desperately poor country. So it's a very, very difficult problem. And you only have to drive down the streets of Dushan Bay and see these beautiful new houses to know that there's a lot of drug money sloshing around Tajikistan. And a lot of that is only facilitated by corruption. And not just by the border guards, at every single level. So it's a, it, it's, it's a problem that um, is very, very difficult to, to, to root out. And you know the best thing we can do is to just be very clear with them and say, Look, we have our own taxpayers that we have to respond to. We want to make sure that our money is going to be used for the appropriate purposes. So when we fund border security efforts, when we fund uh, improvements so that you can scan cargo at bridges uh, from Afghanistan, and, and, and yet there are no seizures taking place, we know there's something wrong. And you're either not using the, the equipment properly, or more likely, that there's corruption. And so we have to start to really condition our assistance and make and make their have there be thresholds and real benchmarks for progress and that's what we're doing because otherwise you're, you're not you're not going to get anywhere but even then I, I, I don't want to uh, you know I don't want to say that this is going to eliminate the problem of corruption 
uh, you know, there are hundreds of millions of dollars worth of drugs going across that border, Tajikistan, and going through Kyrgyzstan, and others as well. So it's sort of lubricating um, many different um, high-level pockets along the way, and it's a uh, it, it's a it's a it's a hard uh, it's a hard issue. And so, but I think again, the only way to really do this is to to appeal to their own self-interest and to explain why how how corrosive this is and how how much this impacts the support of their own people and how this directly feeds into this Arab Spring phenomenon that they have to be very conscious of. And I get, again, I think they, they are conscious of it and, and worry a lot about that. The only, by the way, the only thing that's kind of interesting from, from the Arab Spring perspective is that, ironically, many of these countries, particularly Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, have large numbers of, of the, those angry young men who, would, who were demonstrating in Tunisia and, and Egypt. Most of them are out of the country. They're all working mostly in Russia and elsewhere. And um, so to a certain extent, that provides a little bit of a safety valve for, for some of these countries. But nonetheless, there's, there's, there's sort of a, this combination of grinding poverty and, and, and very high levels of corruption is a very difficult one to, to tackle. And it, it's, we're, we're, we're doing our best. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but it's important to talk about that well, issue. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I appreciate your uh, presentation of the United States' uh, hopes and wishes for the region. Yes. <laughs> and the gains that well, they may have accrued or they may accrue. Yep. But you also uh, made that contingent on partners in the region. And I understand that you're also expressing some doubt about <coughs> the uh, quality of the partners in the region. That is, all five republics in Central Asia have had governments for the last 20 years that have one philosophy, and that is the state is a prize to be captured. And when you capture it, you're not going to let it go. And they have done it quite well. And I think much of the other problems emanate from that quality. In Afghanistan, we have the opportunity not to allow the state to become a prize for somebody to capture. But we have spent half a trillion dollars, lots of American blood, and what we have really gained, if that's what could be called as gain, is a kleptocracy, <coughs> which is no different from the other Central Asian republics. Given the quality of these partners and the quality of the larger regional partners that you refer to, Russia and China, can people of Central Asia expect any real change? The United States policy has been the same, I think, for the last 20 years. And one of the definitions of madness, as we all know, is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Are we in that game, or are we expecting really a different game? Well, again, I, I, would, I think I would respectfully disagree that the United States policy has been the same. I think the president has, has taken a lot of very different policies. and and again, put an enormous amount of effort into uh, not just building up the Afghan National Security Forces, but uh, again, building up indigenous capabilities within Afghanistan uh, on the economic front, uh, in terms of women, education, uh, you name it. They're, the, they're, they're wonderful indicators uh, of, of what has happened. And people tend to focus on all the problems and, and, and fail to recognize that a great deal has been achieved. And you know, uh, so, so I, 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 would, I would say that Afghanistan is a much better place now than it was three or four years ago. To be sure, there are still huge challenges to be faced. It's still one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and when we talk about trying to, trying to transition from an aid-based economy to a trade-based economy, that's still, that's, that's, a, that's a goal. That's not something we're going to achieve tomorrow. But I think that what's important is that there, that, that concrete things are happening. Let me give you some examples. I talked in my speech about how the, 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 the Turkmen and, and the others are, are providing electricity transmission lines, about how they're building the rail lines. Uh, the, the, the Indians, um, who certainly have had their own concerns about Afghanistan, the Indians have put $2 billion of their own money of assistance into Afghanistan. They have invested uh, between eight and ten billion dollars in the in the Hajigak iron ore deposit, 
not just in the, the, the deposit itself, but also in the associated infrastructure that will be needed to, to, to exploit that and to get it to market. So, you know, these are, these, are, these are important things that are happening that are going to provide significant revenues to the government of Afghanistan. Uh, I mentioned the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. You know, that's been on the, that's been on the books and had been talked about for 20 years. Why is it now suddenly happening? Why are there suddenly now the, the, the governments have actually agreed to gas sales purchase agreements? Those are on the books already. The reason is, I would say one, is that India itself is now such a huge market that uh, it can help to drive this process. And uh, <coughs> even if Afghanistan and Pakistan can't pay for the gas, they will derive three or four hundred million dollars just in transit revenues if this pipeline is built. Um, Turkmenistan, for its part, doesn't want to rely only on Russia. It's worried about the Trans-Caspian pipeline, about whether that's ever going to really come to fruition. The Chinese pipeline, likewise, you know, they want to have an alternative pipeline. The, the, the Iranian route is certainly not of, of any great promise because of the obvious problems there. So the India pipeline is, is of great interest to Turkmenistan. So my point is that these regional um, uh, trends are now coming together in a positive way to actually produce facts on the ground that didn't exist before that are going to have a material change. They're not going to happen overnight. And I think that one of the key things, the reason we talk about security, security is such, such an important underpinning of everything else that goes on. We're not going to realistically be able to attract significant new foreign investment unless the ANSF really can take responsibility. It's true that they now res are responsible for 75 percent of the people's security. Uh, the real test is going to come in 2014 when all of the ISAF forces pull back from those responsibilities and the ANS ANSF will be in full control. But we will still be there in a backup and training and so forth. Uh, and I think that will be really the key test, and that's the one that we will all be watching very closely. But again, just having stood up now this army and to see where they've come in a very short period of time is really quite impressive and quite, you know, our, our, our military, who are certainly very as hard-bitten and hard-boiled as they get about these things and very, very tough-minded, I think have been very impressed with, with what they've seen. But there's still more to go. So I, I would say, Sure, it, it, it's okay to be cynic, maybe a little bit cynical, but there, there's, a, there's a lot that has changed. And you can be proud of the money that the United States has, has expended in Afghanistan and that we will continue to spend in Afghanistan. Uh, perhaps we have time for one more question. We've, uh, we've, we've worked you hard. We're over our allotted time, but one more question and then uh, we'll Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, I mean, our contingency plan is exactly what I've just been describing for the last hour, which is to develop this whole vision of regional integration. <coughs> and I will tell you that two years ago when I started, or you know, I really started to work on this regional integration piece, um, we, we, there were a lot of skeptics in the region you know, who were saying, and, and why were they skeptical? They were skeptical because they were afraid that the Taliban was going to take over in 2014. And so they said, well, why on earth would we spend a lot of money on infrastructure and things like that if the Taliban's going to take over? It would be much, make much more sense for us to put up great walls 
between us and, and Afghanistan and try to insulate ourselves from whatever might happen post-2014. And I think there's been a, a tremendous change of attitude among these countries, in part because they do see greater hope now in Afghanistan. And they're now buying into this vision of, of regional integration because they see that they can have a concrete impact on helping this transition. And that's the important change that's taking place now. And that's the thing that I hope all of you will take away from that. That, you know, a country like Turkmenistan, which is a very isolated country that, you know, kind of keeps to itself, takes pride in its, um, in its policy of, of, of neutrality, is actively working to significantly increase its uh, provision of subsidized electricity to, Af to, to Afghanistan. It is you know, actively working now to allow those outlets to, through Turkmenistan to the Caspian Sea. Uh, the, country, the country like Kazakhstan, which could very easily just ignore all these things, is in fact not just working on the, the, uh, the trade routes going east-west from China to Europe, through, a lot of which will traverse through Kazakhstan, but equally importantly looking north-south in ways to incre increase those routes as well. So these countries have not bought into this idea that somehow Afghanistan has become highly destabilized. But, and, and so they, you know, and, and one of the things we're now working on is to try to not just increase these, the, uh, the infrastructure connections, but also the day-to-day the, the, the -day cooperation coordination between Afghans and, uh, and their counterparts. And that, you know, again, we've got, we've got more time to work on that. But, so there, there really is a change of heart, and, and, I, and I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that no one in the United States government has an interest in seeing Afghanistan become destabilized after 2014. We made that mista mistake earlier, and we will not make that mistake again. That's why we, that was the whole purpose of the NATO summit, was to, to outline this vision that we will all be continuing to help train the Afghan National Security Forces to help Afghanistan pay for this, because otherwise it would be a gigantic percentage of their budget. They can't possibly afford to maintain this lar these large security forces. But they need those forces to be able to preserve security, to allow this economic development to occur, to provide jobs, and hopefully to, again, attract support away from the Taliban. Um, so I think that things that things are working, and I, as somebody who talks to the Central Asians, you know, two weeks out of every about, out of every month about this, I think they themselves are more encouraged and are far from putting up barriers. Are doing everything they can now to, to create opportunities for regional integration, and and that's a that's a big change, and um, we'll continue to work hard on this. So thank you so much. <laughs>